So yeah, Brandon, I, I was hoping we could maybe just start a little bit, just, just to give people a little bit of context. Um, who are you? Um, what is your life? What do you, what do you use Rome for? Yeah, certainly. So uh, my name is Brandon. Um, I am a pharmacist in Nova Scotia, Canada. So I'm way out on the East Coast. Um, I use Rome for kind of everything. I, mm -hmm. use it to th I use it to think and my thinking you know, spans across a lot of different areas of my life in different domains. And uh, a lot, it's funny, my experience the last couple of months has been putting through information in the how can I do this in Rome filter. <laughs> And uh, that's been really fruitful. Like I, I find mm. I, I've been able to integrate aspects of my life. I've been able to simplify my visibility on projects. I've been able to think freely and just journal my thoughts and then not to worry too, too much about how that's organized and then just, you know, smash it together eventually and start to see patterns. And uh, I've been thinking more clearly the last four months than I have in as long as I can remember. Pretty cool. Yeah, that, that, that's very cool. And I think that something to just start with there that I've been thinking about a lot lately is it can be really easy to be divergent in Rome. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's basically what it's built for. Um, and so with some usage patterns of Rome, you can end up with much more scrambled thoughts because it has you writing about absolutely everything and you're like, oh, I'm just connecting the knowledge in like whatever free form indentation way as I go, it's gonna work out, you know, like so that, that can lead to divergence, but like yeah. it sounds like you figured out some ways to make sure it, uh, you're convergent there as well and you're thinking crystal clear. Yeah, and I, I think thinking intentionally about divergence and convergence is really important in Rome. You know, like having a sense of just whimsy exploration for a while and then just self-reflecting on how's that working for me. And then yeah. if you realize that it's too scattered, too broad, too diverse, too expansive, then say, well, what do I need? You know, what, what would make this better? And what, what things should I force myself to look into? Or how can I constrain my attention a little bit more intentionally? Mm -hmm. And then build those systems, you know, like the, the beauty of Rome is that you can change it. You can change how your information is presented to you. You can change how your information is designed and, uh, and structured. And it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to do that. So I, I think the self-explorative path mixed with, you know, a, a self-awareness of how is this working and then a willingness to experiment and change is the recipe for success in Rome. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. I mean, that's actually something that I think can intimidate a lot of early users is they'll see a bunch of people with these advanced use cases and workflows and they're like, oh my God, that looks like so much work. I can't do that. Or alternatively, oh my God, I don't have it all figured out right now yeah. you know like how will i use rome if i'm just going to create something that's not useful for me in future systems or whatever but totally. but like the most the most effective users of rome i think they they really iterate as they go you know yeah. they're, they're constantly asking themselves like you said uh what do i need and how can i uh, adjust my systems for that and it's funny, like when, when I think about advanced features and when I think about kind of pushing the limits of what's possible with Rome, that's fun sometimes, but it's also kind of just my method of exploration. I like to test the yeah. edges. I like to know where the edges are so that I can build really reliable rules within those fences. Um, and if I don't push the edges, then I don't even understand what's possible. And then that, that kind of stumps or like limits my imagination potential. Um, but then if I understand what's possible, then I can think more reliably within a set of rules and I can make really great systems that end up being more basic than the edges, but they end up being quite reliable. Are you a gamer or were you ever one? Never. <laughs> you Never. know, PS1, PS2, and then kind of fell off the edge. <laughs> okay. Because only thing I was thinking is, I mean, I identify with that a lot. I, mm. I like to be at the edge of understanding Rome's yes. functionalities uh, and all the nuances of them. I really like tinker around to figure out how they work. And, in, and I think that a lot of that came from my background in the gaming community. Like back when I was in competitive Super Smash Bros. Melee um, in college. Whoa. I, That's sick. Yeah, yeah that, <laughs> that one was fun. 
I wasn't any good <laughs> at it, but, but it's like, there I just button online... mash. that's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, there were just online communities and uh, in-person communities as well. And they were really just like dissecting the game, you know, like they were mm-hmm. experimenting and analyzing every little thing so they could understand the rules of the game. So that way they could play the game better. Um, yeah. And, and that's kind of how I think about it is, and, and, you know, eventually those rules, they become so intuitive to yeah. you that like, like you just, because you understand all these boundary conditions really well and you've played around with it, they're intuitive. And so you're not yeah. thinking too hard about the rules. You're just, you just have a stronger intuition, you know? And I yeah. think that's something that Rome does with people who really stick with it and iterate and play around is it builds a very effective intuition. Yeah. But, and, and, and that being said, like, you don't have to take that approach. That's just my personality. Yeah. Um, and like, I, I'm just deeply curious and I like to understand something really thoroughly and I'm willing to put the time yeah. in, like, I'm willing to not watch Netflix and instead, you know, just like mess around in Rome for a couple hours. Um, but, uh, I don't think you have to do that. Like, I think the beauty yeah. is that enough people do that so that they can build some guidelines, some conventions and some, some use cases that are really compelling that end up being more plug and play, you know, like mm-hmm. download this template and go to town. And then all of a sudden you've taken the 10 hours I took to experiment something and just constrained it into, you know, 15 minutes to, you know, figure out how to install it. And then another 15 minutes to figure out how to use it. And you're just as far, you're, you're caught up. Yeah. Would totally agree. Not everyone needs to be an explorer, you know, but, but the fact that there are so many explorers is pretty great. And, and so I guess this Amazing. leads me, leads us into smart blocks, um, yes. which are the main topic of our conversation today. They seem like they have a lot of potential to change people's workflows, but also to allow people to share workflows um, mm-hmm. better than they ever have before. So can you just tell me, like, what are smart blocks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll start off right there. Um, it, it's funny, and, and I think the, the preface that we had to this conversation is really important because these can seem really complex. And it's almost like you're opening up another world of possibilities within Rome. And that can either be really exciting from a curiosity and testing the edge cases perspective, or it can be really overwhelming as in like, oh my God, I don't know how to use this. Um, And it can be really complex or it can be really simple and you really get to pick what type of user you are. And that's the beauty of this. So what smart blocks are is they're an extension built by uh, Chris in Rome 42 to be able to populate a template engine. So it's, it's mostly around expansions, but there's certain commands that are built into the expansions such that when the expansion runs, it can execute certain activities or actions. So then it becomes a bit of a programming, uh, I guess, environment. And you can have it do things that you want it to do or expand a template in a, in a, in a way that you want it to or you know, calculate a date or grab something from a website. Um, they're really quite limitless in their potential, but really it's just, it's just a template expander at its basic. Okay, so it's a template expander, but it's broken down into, but it also includes like Rome specific things. Yeah, I yeah. Okay. So- I used to use text expander and kind of why, why I switched to smart blocks was because it's, it's built with Rome in mind. So when, when I'm at work, when I'm using my, um, my computers in the pharmacy environment, I don't have my usual extensions. I don't have, um, it's not set up like my Mac is. And sometimes I find myself working in that environment differently because I'm relying on extensions in my, my home environment, like text expander. If I don't have the ability to populate a daily template or to, you know, populate a a projects page or, really anything, um, then it limits what I can do. So I end up working around things. What's mm. nice about smart blocks is it works on every device. So it's built as like Rome mm. slash JS. So yeah, I find it everywhere. And then all of a sudden I don't need text expander to be downloaded on every computer that I use. Beautiful. Mm. Just right there is simple and awesome. Honestly, that's my main use and, case. And so, what sorts of things do people even use something like text expander for? Yeah. So if I was to go to like my my daily page here and I was just to start the day. Some people will start and they'll just start, you know, typing things manually from here. And I think a lot mm-hmm. of new users would do that because there's not really anything in Rome that encourages you to do anything based on templates. But what a lot of people realize is that writing in the daily page is really the best way to use Rome. And you yeah. can kind of leap 
I'm there. It gives you an extra piece of information. The date something was created, documented, the day a task was you know, started or a conversation was had. Being able to write on the daily page has a lot of advantages, but it's blank, it's basic. And it's, uh, you know, sometimes you can just scratch your head and say, what am I doing here? But if you start to use templates intentionally, you can orchestrate your intention and your attention in a way that is really powerful. Um, and you can lead yourself into the day, gaining context and perspective. So what I would do now is I would, two semicolons will launch a smart block, yeah. and then I'll pick a basic version of a, of a daily template, and then we're off, to, we're off to the races. And everybody's daily template will look very different, but mine is kind of structured so that nothing really lives at the root level. Like I, I don't like to have anything that I can't collapse because I like to return to that simplicity sometimes. But then I can open these up and I can have just different domains that I work within. Maybe it's I go in here and I say I'm going to do a morning journal. And then I go in and I start to engage in that. And it'll automatically populate the time. It'll pull in these block references. It'll create a to-do. And then it'll you know, lead, uh, launch me into the to-do from the day prior because I just tacked that onto there as just basic text. But then you, so, you can start to see how these extensions can start to direct my day. Okay, so with the block references here, how does this work? You know, like is it, are, are these just like text that it's copy pasting in or alternatively is it like grabbing the block references from somewhere? Yeah, it can sense? do, it, it does and it can do either. And it just depends on what you want. So okay. if I go into my prompts, so this is kind of a library of questions that I might have. Yeah. And then I think towards the bottom of here is where these smart blocks live. So if I go into the morning journal one here, so this is what ran that smart block and what made it possible. So here, right. these are just straight block references. So I just have it as the text would be the block reference ID. And then if I'm to open that, I'll see that that lives within my prompts library. Mm -hmm. So it's just simply copying it that way. But okay. then you'll also notice these time, AM, PM, and these date yesterday, those are other smart block commands that are included in that smart block expansion. Okay, what, 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 what are these? What? So if I go back to the daily page and I mm -hmm. show where that journal populated, the AM PM will create yeah. the time that I ran that, that right. smart block in the okay. AM PM format. And then the, the other one was, what was it? Yeah, date yesterday. So this one is, uh, I don't have it in my demo database, but um, I have a couple of daily stats that I maintain. You know, how was my sleep? Um, how was my diet? Uh, how was my focus? And this is just a prompt for me to go back and just finish up that, that array of information. And then this date yesterday gives me just a quick jump portal back to yesterday so that I can easily get to the source of that information. Um, so date yesterday, all that does is it creates this date yesterday link. Okay. So that, that, that's all pretty cool so far. Uh, one thing I saw you say on Twitter mm -hmm. um, in some thread was that you're starting to like using smart blocks more than you like queries. Yes. Um, I, I really want to see what you mean by that. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's start by going into the Rome 42. Um, okay. uh, just the different commands that are available. And then we'll loop back and look at some of the ways that that becomes a bit of a query engine. Great. But uh, I think it's important to kind of understand the, the anatomy of a smart block in, in a, a bit more, uh, a bit more clarity before we jump into something more advanced. Great. So within just Rome42.com, which will expand into Rome Hackers uh, public database here, um, the instructions for smart blocks are conveyed there. So you can go smart blocks on the side here and it will take you to this page. Reading through this is a really great idea if you're just getting started with smart blocks. That's the first okay. thing I did was go through, read um, a little bit of the terminology used, a little bit of the syntax, how to launch one, the different commands and, uh, and uh, things that are available to run. Um, but it's broken down into a, a workflow is what the smart block will do. So everything that you contain nested underneath a smart block 
is the workflow. It's the series of activities that will, that will be done. The actions are the steps that are completed by the smart block and the trigger is the thing you do to activate it. So the trigger is that double semicolon and it brings up your, your mm -hmm. pre-populated list. If you want to create a smart block, you need to actually have the 42 smart block tag. That's what populates it into that dropdown. So mm -hmm. if we go back here where I had that, uh, um, that morning journal, you'll notice this 42 smart block tag in the title. If that's not there, that smart block doesn't exist. So okay. any, any block can be a smart block. And then if this is in the title, then everything beneath it is what will be populated as the smart block workflow. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then when we're building them, it's good to know like what building blocks are available. So they're called smart blocks because there's all of these different components that you can kind of mix and match and build either from really simple, you know, one thing happens or you can have it so that it's more complex. But it's, under it's important to understand what blocks are available. So that's these, this command reference. So this library here gives a list of all the things that are possible with block references. Mm -hmm. or not with block references, with smart blocks, sorry. Yeah. So the really common ones might be, you know, date. If you want to populate the date, you can have it say, so it always starts with this open bracket percent sign and then ends with percent sign kind of to enclose the command. Mm -hmm. And then the action is going to be the, uh, the date here. And then after that semicolon or after that colon is the parameter. So that's the text that goes within that command. So date yeah. today will populate today. Date Friday will populate Friday. Date five days from now, and that'll use natural language. So this is really a really versatile smart block. Uh, time, so you can so, do- So with something yeah. like this, could, could I create like a birthday template or something, yep. you know, like where I say, whose ber who's birthday is it today? Whose birthdays are it today, I guess, you know? Yeah. And, then it, and then you could set- um, hmm each person's birthday to have a different, just yearly repeating date. Yep. Um, the repeating date. So assigning the, the date so that it's always like the, the thing with birthdays like March in Rome. 14th, March 14th. That's my birthday. You know, like, could I say March 14th and then it would just be every year, March 14th. That's Rob's birthday. Yeah. I wonder. Um, I haven't found a way to be able to do that yet, but I, I think we mm -hmm. could probably get creative in finding a way to communicate that. The only way I know how to do the birthdays now is like almost as part of an annual review, change your birthdays from like 2020 yeah. into 2021 so that they actually appear in the right place. Um, but we can probably figure something out that way. I think this is starting to get possible. That'd be cool. It'd replace yep. a big part of what keeps people on Facebook. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I actually, there was one point where I actually had a, um, a task that would be at the start of the month where it would be go into Facebook, take all of the birthdays, import them into Rome, and then leave. That's just my action. Really? And nice. then if I repeat the year, then I'm now not reliant on Facebook for birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Haven't finished it yet, but that's a, that's a project ongoing. Um, yeah, so the, the date and time ones are pretty basic, and you can go in there for the syntax. Mm -hmm. the, the workflow commands here get kind of cool. Um, what's a good one to review? Block mentions is probably the most powerful one so far. And this is the one that actually starts to power the queries. So this is, it returns a list of blocks that mention a page reference with optional filtering. It's designed bracket percent block mentions and then the first thing is how many it's going to return. So it returns up to 15 blocks with the to read tag. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where it's a bit of a query. You're asking your database for all mentions of to read and then listing them all as block, ref or as block references. And listing 15 of them. And listing 15 of them. Or if you okay. wanted to get more specific and you wanted them to be books, also have book in the text of the block, then you can add book. Or book and another term book and pinnacle, then it will do that. Or book, but not pinnacle, and you can put this minus sign. So you can start okay. to have and and not. Okay, so some questions here. So one advantage I'm seeing already of just queries, you know, is just an ease of use side uh, thing, yep. 
where you can type in the double brackets to pull up the names of the pages. So there's autocomplete for your pages and you don't yeah. need to be super exactly precise with it. Like I could see this being a little bit challenging if I'm yeah. not just doing the brackets, I guess. Yeah, and I was, I was being a little facetious when I said that it's, I like it better than queries. It's probably uh -huh. more my routine. Like if I'm using a set query in an intentional way, I yeah. find the user experience with smart blocks is better and I'll show you why. So if I go into my daily template and instead of my basic version, I'm going to put a couple more advanced smart blocks in here. So I'm going to go daily, try this one. Yeah. So, oh, Okay, so that is the same thing, but with a little bit more detail. So if I collapse all these, it looks very similar to where it was before. Yeah. Right? But what I did was, if I look under the GTD one, I have a scheduled today set of smart blocks that I ran. Mm -hmm. And what I want here is any tasks with today's date in the block in the format of an embed with the page that it came from. So this gives me the tasks that I wanted to do today and it gives me the ability to edit them directly. Yeah. And gives me the context of the page. Mm -hmm. So this goes towards some of the stuff you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier with directing attention, right? Mm -hmm. you, get to, you get to choose what you're visualizing in the results of it. Um, you get to choose how many of them you're visualizing as well. Like I noticed above, or maybe it was below, you have like three uh, random housekeeping um, yes. things, you know? So, so I guess you can set it to just be a random set of items and a random limited set of items. So one game I've wanted to play with my, uh, sort of like play with myself before. And if you want, maybe we could try creating this right yep. now. Um, I've thought, hey, wouldn't it be fun to start off my day with a list of five random block references or page references from my graph, probably yep. page references, mm -hmm. and try to draw connections to as many of them as I can. Like, just like as a little morning creativity exercise, right? Yep. So is that something you could do with this? It is. And I would actually go a little bit more specific. So um, okay. pe people talk about like these, the, give me a random block for my graph or a random page for my graph. And there's so many different types of pages in my graph that a, a straight randomization of all of them could return something utterly meaningless. Yeah. Um, but there's also ways that I specifically tag information so that it's more predictable. Um, so are you familiar with the Zettelkast and workflow a little bit? Mm, yeah. Okay, so um, there's different types of notes within a Zettelkasten, and like within the, the types of terminology that I would use would be like fleeting notes, I'll use seedlings, and then more permanent notes or evergreen notes, literature notes, and mm -hmm. reference notes. And you might have information already classed into those categories. Yeah. I could say give me five permanent notes each okay. day. So in your case, that sounds a little bit more intentional because they're the types of things that you're going to want to be drawing those connections between. Okay, right? so I probably maybe do, not. I probably translate that as uh, doing a set of my blog ideas or blog premises. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you could say, "Give me five random blog premises today," yeah. and then write three lines on each, and then nice. that could be a way. Right. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to actually direct your, your attention in a really meaningful way because that's mm -hmm. driving your focus right off the go. Yeah, that, make, that sounds really cool. So can we try making that? Yeah, right certainly. So let's go to the, so I see if I can find something similar. So the idea that I'm kind of messing around with right now is this idea of controlled randomization. So yeah. it's, it's not a full blown randomization, but it's something, yeah, something a little bit more constrained. So here's a couple that I've already built. So um, I can say, give me a random block mention of seedlings, a random block mention of fleeting notes, and a random block mention of Zettel questions. Mm -hmm. So I can populate one of those, just going random Zettel question, 
Uh, sometimes you just get the place where the page is mentioned. <laughs> ah, I don't have a whole lot in my demo database, so there's less here. There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was working the other day and we were listening to our local radio station and it plays a lot of stuff from like the early 2000s. And it was like, why, why do they do that? You know, why do radio, local radio stations play old music? The, you know, newer music's available. Is it because people want older stuff? Is it, you know, so it's just an open question that I had in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and pulling a random question can help to, uh, I guess, bring me into that thought space. Or I can go cool. random fleeting note and I can get a random thought that way. But if we want to try to build something along the lines you were thinking, yeah, let's go into here. And oh, can, can I just ask a quick question on what you just showed? Yeah. I think the reason why some of them were just block references that just had hashtag Zettel question or, or Zettel cast, cast in on it, um, is, is that just because of your indentation structure? You know, like some blocks where you tag that, you'll actually tag the name of it in the same block. And some blocks, it's like indented underneath it or something. Say if, say if like in my CSS, for example, um, like I see all these tags within here. Yeah. They're tags within my database. But if I was to say, give me a random action item, it might mm. return this block. Got it. Right? So that's kind of useless. But um, we're working on ways to avoid some of those. So I might say, give me a random block, but avoid the code block symbol. Mm. So, right? So reduce that from the options that you return to me. Um, and that's yeah. you know, just a weird little way that I'm trying to avoid some false positives. But anyway, um, the, the, the workaround is just running it again. <laughs> you know, if you don't like the results, yeah. re-spin the wheel. You know, shake the magic eight ball again. And that works just fine. Mm -hmm. So, um, what was it that you wanted to build? So you wanted to build uh, five random block references? Or five random page references to uh, blog ideas or, you know, some equivalent that you might have in here. Okay. So I'm going to name my smart block and this is just going to what's pop, uh, what's going to pop into the drop down menu. And then I'm going to okay. go 42 smart block is going to activate that. And then now everything I have indented underneath is now part of the smart block template. So if I'm going to want to um, build a random with blog ideas, and then we'll say five blog ideas, and that'll be, we'll do a block mentions. And then this is the command that if we go, I use the guide all the time because it's hard to remember yeah. the, act, the actual parameters. So if I go into here, I'll see that parameter one is the maximum amount of blocks to return. Parameter two is the page name. Okay, so that's all we need. So then five, because we want five, and then blog ideas. Mm -hmm. okay. And then this will now return five blog ideas. But will they be five random blog ideas or will they be the five most recent or something? Yeah, so there'll be five random. He also added today. So Chris just made an update today that I haven't had a chance to review, but there is a block mentions dated function now. And this gives you the ability to say within a certain range. So you can do it um, and you can sort it by ascending. So the oldest ones first, yeah. the newest ones first, or none and just have it randomize the way that the Rome um, database engine will return them. Mm -hmm. So then you have a little bit of control. You can say, give me new ones, give me old ones, give me random ones. And then this starts to become really flexible. Okay, cool. All right. So I just, mm, I'm just making a bunch of fake blog ideas. Okay. So we've got a bunch of blocks that have blog ideas there. And then if I go in and I try and run our new smart block, We'll remember that I named it mm -mm -mm, Robert's Smart Block. Mm -hmm. I go here, Robert's Smart Block. Beep, 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 beep. It's pretty cool. Pretty awesome. Cool. So I'm even seeing now someone could maybe build a personal news feed for them, for themselves into Rome. So that way, you know, like maybe instead of uh, checking social media, you're looking through a list of block references 
that you just pull in through throughout your database. Um, you can just delete any that you don't like and don't really care about at the moment. You can elaborate on any that you do like, you know, and then as a result, you could end up with sort of like a database where your most important stuff has the most page and block references. Yeah, I think there's a lot of thought that could be put into that exact thing. And I yeah. think that's actually one of my long-term hopes for Rome. I think that um, Rome and multiplayer Rome, when we start to have the ability to reference blocks from outside of our database in, from someone else's, then we can actually create a oh. bit of a pseudo social network. Because what if I can pull three of Robert's blog ideas and he's given me permission to access certain section of his database? Um, you know, some of it might be public facing mm -hmm. and then those are the ones that I can pull in with randomization. Or maybe you can post updates, you know, about Benny, about this vacation that you just took and that could be your posts. And then I could have Rob in a class, um, a tag within my uh, structure called like, you know, close friends or something. And I'll say that I always want to hear my close friend updates. Mm -hmm. So anything that Robert posts in, in updates, I want to know about it. And then I can kind of, I can start to build my own algorithm for yeah. how I'm interacting with my feed rather than just leaving that up to these big companies like, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really cool. And that's definitely a goal uh, worth aspiring to. Um, I wonder if to, you know, something that I'm sure a lot of people are really curious about um, with smart blocks is we've heard whisperings and tell of integrations um, and how it enables integrations with other uh, services, you know, hmm. so like that could, that could potentially like integrate into things like email and your Twitter and you could choose exactly what stuff shows up in your feed from there too. Um, well, I'm curious, do you have anything to show uh, around the integration side of things or to describe even? Yeah, a okay. lot of that has to do with what people are doing with JavaScript. So smart blocks Ooh. are also JavaScript enabled. So you can actually write code in JavaScript language and have it executed by the smart blocks. That is where I haven't had the chance to dive into yet because mm -hmm. I don't know JavaScript. <laughs> but um, the community is starting to build a set of resources. So um, on the, the Rome Hacker GitHub, there is a smart blocks repository. And in there, there's a label called uh, smart blocks. And this is just a, a place to put examples that people are come out, coming up with. Mm. So, so how I can see this evolving is that as more and more people start to use smart blocks, start to exercise in their creativity into what they might find interesting or useful, and they have a place to post that, then we can start to see what other people are creating, simply copy it into our database, and away we go. Like for example, um, I can... Yeah, I swear. When I, when I first saw the, the conversation with um, Rome Hacker, and Violetta and Connor, you know, like that was one of my first thoughts. I was like, did, did Rome Hacker accidentally just invent Rome Depot? Is, is this yeah. finally happening? <laughs> right? kind, like, kind of, yeah, yeah. It's like a, a depot for smart blocks, but uh, yeah, this is cool. And it evolves really regularly. So it's funny because this conversation could, there could be a new element of smart blocks, a new command that uh, uh, enables something totally different within a week or two. And uh, mm -hmm. that's really exciting. But like, say if I go here, and uh, this is one that I think I pulled. Yeah, stoic quote. So I don't have a library of stoic quotes in my, uh, in my demo database here. But when I do this, it will grab a quote from online. Now, if you ask me how it works, I'm going to say, I don't know. Probably involves something to do with going to a stoicquote.com and grabbing a random quote. But uh, that's contained within within this repository. So there's a fetch random stoic quote from stoic-quotes.com, almost had it. <laughs> okay, can we just like look through these a little bit? You know, like let's just scroll from top to bottom. Like I wanna see some of the things that people have been making. Yeah. 
Okay, so one that I saw, so add Wikipedia extract to a page. So is yeah, that, that sounds cool. What, what, what's that doing? Is that just like taking the first paragraph or two? Incredible. Yeah, because that's usually what you want. You just want the Coles yeah. notes on the thing and you want to bring it in to your own database to have it, you know, so that it's not just an empty page, page reference. That's pretty cool. I think I saw something in there too uh, with Todoist. Yep, Todoist, yep. Okay, pulling in active block, active tasks in Rome. So like that would mean someone would have good quick capture for to-dos, you know, because yep. they could just work with uh, Todoist and then it would just show up in Rome. Yep. Um, yeah, this, this is really cool that people can just like make these, um, share them. Yeah, I think that templates have a lot of potential in general, just for like helping people figure things out. You know, um, I've already seen the power of just having like, just finding random JS snippets that people make, you know, yeah. like in, in adding them into my Rome database. But it's like, this is, some of the value here is that this is put into a centralized repository you know, um, and also that it's things that people will do directly into their database. So it's not like modifying the functionality of Rome so much, or maybe in a few ways it is, but like for the most part, these are just like actions you perform, if that makes yeah. sense. It does. Yeah. It's non-destructive. It's like, it's, uh, you know, we're really just expanding content. So we're adding something where, um, you know, running a calculation within the expansion, um, but it's all contained within the expansion. So it doesn't really disrupt anything else within your database. It's even different than a, like a full JavaScript extension in that way. In that mm -hmm. it doesn't really change how your database behaves. It's just an action you can run, like you say. So what are some of the most interesting ways you've seen people use smart blocks? Yeah. So what I can really see with this is, it goes from simple text expansion templates mm -hmm. all the way to full algorithms of thought. So that's the thing that I'm kind of chasing is to be able to think about how do I typically work through a problem and then mm -hmm. can I create an environment that guides me through that process? Yeah. Like can I have a series of prompts that I answer a question to and then depending on my response, maybe it changes the next question. Maybe I'm creating a, a virtual conversation partner of sorts that keeps me on the rails, that keeps me focused, that helps to think things through in different ways to maybe support brainstorming and expansion or to support um, more, more convergence and coming down into the specificity of what's the next action on this hypothetical project that I might have come up with. And it's... I think the possibility now is building these. I think we can start to build algorithms of thought and that's really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, and, and when you phrase it like that, you know, like I'm not sure I ever really understood what people meant when they were talking about algorithms of thought, but yeah. I, I, I realized that I've been doing something like that for a while, you know, where anytime I come across some behavioral science theory, um, or, or alternatively, every time I solve a problem in a way that I think is repeatable, you know, like I just yep. create a list of question prompts for myself, you know, so like I have a lens for, and, and I call them lenses. I, I have a lens for determining whether your rewards will undermine intrinsic motivation. Um, yeah. I have a lens for getting started with onboarding horizontal, uh, onboarding and horizontal products, which is something that's been really useful with, um, and, and that I've been building out as a result of my work with guided track, you know, and it's just like, it's kind of what you were saying where, you know, like I might even have within one of my lenses, like I'll have a list of questions, but I'll also like maybe one of those questions is a link to another lens of mine, you yeah. know, and, and then it's sort of like it's creating these um, fluid pathways where I yes. can be reasonably sure that I'm thinking through things in an appropriate way, you know, and, and so I'm seeing smart blocks might be really useful there.
Yeah, it's a way to combat your blind spots. It's maybe yeah. if you came at a problem and it was too broad, it was too diverse, it was too unstructured, um, to just come at that with only your reflexive intuition, you might miss something. Mm -hmm. But if you have a standard process on how you tackle a problem or how you, you know, dissect a research paper or how you complete an assessment of something, then yeah. you can have that as a guided process and a workflow that you just engage. And then if we start to think in those workflows, if we start to apply a, a kind of an awareness to what are you doing anyway? And then is this something repeatable? And then how can I make that process explicit? and then plug it into a smart block or something else, and then just run it whenever I need to. So the example that I'm thinking of here, um, too, of how someone might go from creating resources for themselves to creating repeatable workflows and algorithms of thought, I guess you would call them, um, for themselves, too, is, you know, I have a page that I use called Questions for Prospects. Mm -hmm. And it's just a list of ideas for things I could ask any prospect and I'll go through it to prepare for a meeting with someone new. And I'm thinking, okay, that's a resource for myself. Um, that's like a template, I guess. But like, could I create maybe an algorithm that would be go through the process of figuring out which questions to ask instead of just here's a list of questions to ask here what's your process for figuring out what questions to ask this specific client you know and turning that yes. into a smart block and an algorithm of thought yeah you, you could absolutely do that and but it, it requires depth of thought like it requires depth mm -hmm. of thought into how do you decide what questions to ask you know yeah. and what sensory input can you use to feed that decision making. Mm -hmm. And that gets really challenging. Um, but I think as, as this stuff matures, and as maybe the Rome API matures, and we can start having data come into Rome, and then have some sort of dynamic engine that creates an output, then we can create processes for how we relate to information. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, but that's, that's, again, kind of looking at tomorrow, yeah. like, I mean, it's kind of looking at tomorrow, but like, there's a lot of stuff people can do without the API, uh, even at this point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just with a little bit of intentionality to it, you know, and, and I think that this sort of encodes a generally good practice for knowledge workers, I think, which is, yep. as you're going, document what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yes. Um, document your own process uh, so that way you're not just solving the problem once, you're solving it multiple times maybe, or at least making it easier to solve uh, multiple times, right? Like th that's how, I mean, I have an article on Rome Brain about it, but like that's how I ended up using, uh, coming up with my process for like looking lenses, you know, it is really just being conscious and aware of what your own processes are, writing them down. So yeah. that way you can refer to that as well. And then if you've already written it down, then why not turn it into a workflow template? Um, I think that the only thing that I would caveat here is to, with the algorithms of thought, I think it's really important to always remember that it's there to serve a purpose for your thought, right? Hmm. Um, so for example, if I have a journal, you know, if I'm keeping a journal for myself and I have a few journaling prompts, what do I do if I just suddenly wanna go off on a tangent? I should let myself. Or alternatively, yes. if I'm trying to find out the answer to a problem and this algorithm of thought takes me a few steps of the way there and I'm, pretty sure I found the answer to the problem, then I don't need to continue necessarily. Right. You know, like it's, it's like they're there to serve a purpose. Um, don't let it become too rigid to the point where you don't have creative flexibility. Yeah, yeah. And I think we should be building creative flexibility into our algorithms of thought. I think, <laughs> you know, it, but honestly, that's it. Like it's it, like, there's ways that you can do this where they're, they're too unstructured, or they're too structured. And there will always be this dance of finding that, that blend and finding that nuance that really works well for you. But we need to be able to work intuitively as well as yeah. prescriptively. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you need yeah. a little bit of guidance. You need to be able to say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, then that, then that, then that, then that. But if your intuition says something different and you feel like running with that, that's the answer sometimes. So having that built-in flexibility could be as mm -hmm. simple as, you know, within a prescribed template, have at each stage something you can, like it's like an exit button that's like, I know the answer. I'd like to solve the puzzle. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then that can all be designed, right? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd agree with all that. Um, definitely. Uh, so before we hop off, what, what advice would you have for people getting started with smart blocks? But then also, what advice would you give to new Roam users? And when do you think people should start using smart blocks? Oh, they're all really good questions. I think some things to keep in mind is that just because a tool is available within Roam doesn't mean you need to use it right away mm -hmm. and doesn't mean that you need to be able to master it right away and doesn't mean that you need, just because a JavaScript is possible within Smartblocks doesn't mean that you have to use it in order to get the benefit of it. Um, I think the best way to think about this is the way to think about everything in Roam in that uh, it's low floor, high ceiling. Use it at its basic and then just layer complexity as you feel as you feel pulled towards it or as you feel that it's necessary to do something that you do anyway. So the best place to start with smart blocks is probably just automating some of the things you do anyway. Like if mm -hmm. there's a way that you normally structure your daily page, build a smart blocks daily page template. And it could be as simple as three lines of text. And that still has value because then you're getting into the process of using the smart block to, to complete that, mm -hmm. that workflow. And then once you get comfortable in there, you'd say, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could add the date in there? Then, you know, look up in the Rome42.com smart blocks guide, the command for adding a date, and then start to layer that complexity. Mm -hmm. And the way that I think about it is, you know, what kind of user are you? And people can kind of self-identify with these categories. Like you can say, are, am I absolute entry? And then it's, you know, know the basics, know the anatomy of a mm -hmm. smart block, know that in order to make a smart block, I need to have the 42 smart blocks tag on it. Know that everything underneath that becomes the smart block. Um, know that in order to run it, I do the two semicolons and find the thing that I, that I just created. Yeah. Right. That's the basics. That's all you need and know where to find the information, know where, know where the instructions are, you know, and then that's going to be Rome 42.com. So then if you're in here and then you can search for what you need using the table of contents and the listed and knowing where to find blocks that are pre-built. So if you're entry, you don't need to exercise creativity and building everything yourself, know how to get to the, um, the GitHub. And we can probably link to that. So that that's easy to find. So that's the basics. But then, then if you're a builder, you know, know what can be a smart block, know the commands and the parameters. So like when I started using this, I read this document start to finish just to know what was possible. And then mm -hmm. if you start to know where the boundaries are, you can start to be creative within them and then you can start to build something. And for, for the builders, what I'd, what I'd recommend would be to document, document your tracks, share with the community, um, join the, um, the Rome 42 channel on Slack, um, talk to people that are building things, ask questions. If you can't quite figure something out, make a post in there. Um, and then as you figure out something cool, post it here as a smart block example, because that's where I think the power of scale is going to be really cool. If we can start to get a couple dozen, couple hundred, eventually a couple thousand people creating these types of things in the Rome community, then this could get very, very cool because somebody mm -hmm. has an idea and then everybody levels up to that, uh, to that place. And then everybody's yeah. thinking creatively at a new level and then somebody else makes a breakthrough and then we're all thinking at this level. So I think this could even accelerate over time. So if you're a builder, know how to leverage community and know how to share your work so that others can build on your work. And then if you're uh, you know, a, a tester uh, or if you're a contributor, like if you're somebody that just comes up with, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, there's the rules of the game, but also know that people make the rules and that the rules are fluid and that the commands, if there's something you're trying to do that can't be done right now, and you can imagine what that might look like, make suggestions. Um, there's, an, there's a spot to list ideas in the same GitHub. Um, so it's not just about examples. You can, you can document bugs, you can document ideas. 
and I do this all the time. Um, I'll, I'll message in the Slack channel or I'll, uh, if, I'll say like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do more with randomization? And then I'll, I'll make that suggestion. So you can also create the future by using your imagination. And if the existing constraints of what can be done with a smart block doesn't serve your workflow, communicate that in a way that's effective. And who knows, maybe in a couple of weeks time, that problem will be navigated. And, and I think that's even just a good framework for thinking about, you know, using Rome in general, right? Like, are, are you entry? Are you builder? Are you tester and contributor? You know, like in the builders, you don't need to be at the forefront of Rome in yeah. order to, at the frontier of Rome in order to um, build something that's really practical and really useful for you. Yeah. I mean, heck, you don't even need to be at the builder level to build something that's practical and useful for you. Low no, floor, no. wide walls, high ceiling. The, the really the stuff that makes the most difference for me is the stuff that I use every day. Like if I create a project and I create that project right now and then I go in and I just go project template, I create something this is automatically tagged with the ways that I like it. It has a date created that actually has today's date. I can then add a couple of housekeeping things. So these are the things that I always want Wait, to be. Go I ahead. just want to point out, I love that you have the not populated tag on all of those. Um, I didn't think, I wouldn't have thought about that uh, initially, but that's just really great because, you know, if you're looking through the linked references for people and, and there's going to, you're going to end up with a lot of, uh, attributes that aren't populated. Like, yes. That's just how it is. It filters out a lot of the noise. So that's great. Cool stuff. Any last uh, things you want to say, show? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could talk about this forever. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the, 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 this is a conversation starter. It's certainly not a comprehensive guide to smart blocks. Um, the best thing to do is come at it with curiosity, um, engage mm -hmm. in community. And uh, at this point, it's beta. So you have to have an experimentation mindset. Um, this will be probably clarified and formalized and streamlined and, you know, made more robust uh, in the coming weeks and months. Um, so if you're a really novice user, hold off and wait. You probably don't need mm -hmm. it yet. But um, it's super stable and it's really functional and it's really exciting. So, uh, you know, jump in and have some fun. Sounds great. Well, thanks, Brandon. My pleasure. Anytime.